and hungry. I spend every Sunday just living good. Morning, guys. Dave Canterbury at the Pathfinder School. You know, in 1755, James Smith was captured by Chautauqua Indians, and he lived with them for five years. If you read accounts in history, there are lots and lots of things that can be gleaned and understood about their basic survival mentality and what they actually needed to affect their survival and what they used to affect their survival just by looking through these tombs of evidence from diaries and written journals. And he documented very well his time spent with the Indians, but what I want to look at today is I want to look at fire and fire mentality. And one of the things that happened with James Smith after he was captured is, as oftentimes occurred back then, he was adopted into the tribe as one of their own. And he was fairly young when he was captured, and he was basically turned into one of their own people. He was taken down, ceremonial, had his hair all plucked out except scalp locks, you know, dressed up in their Indian garb, washed in the river to wash away all of the white blood from his body, brought back up and ritually put on Indian clothing, breech clout, moccasins, leggings. He was given a blanket and he was given a flint and steel. And I think it's important to understand that because the items that he was given as a person of the tribe were basic clothing, a woolen blanket, and a flint and steel. So he was given the way to affect fire as part of his daily life. Now, as you go on and read through his journal, you see that at one point he was actually given a gun, a flint lock of some sort, probably a musket trade gun of sorts, and he got lost from a party of hunters, went off on a trail following a game trail and got lost, and he got scared because he was alone and it was becoming dark, and he fired his musket into the air and hooped and hollered a little bit, hoping that someone would come and find him, sort of like what we would do today in a search and rescue scenario. Unfortunately, when the Indians found him, they took away his rifle or his gun and reduced him to a bow and arrow for the next two years because of his foolhardiness in A, probably getting lost, and B, firing useless shots into the air, giving away the position of the hunting party. So he was reduced to a bow and arrow at this point in time. He later on went on to get lost two, on two other occasions that he describes. In both of those occasions, he speaks of not having his flint and steel or forgetting his flint and steel and not being able to affect fire. If you read between the lines of that and you think about that, this is a man who's lived with the Indians for two years. He's been adopted into their tribe, taught their culture, taught their way of dress, taught their customs, taught all of the secrets of hunting and tracking and trapping. Uh, he talks extensively about trapping beaver, hunting raccoon and things of that nature for pelts to sell. And he had no knowledge of friction fire. And I mean bow drill, hand drill, fire plow, not necessarily friction by rock and steel, but primitive friction fire. So at that point in 1750s, friction fire may have been all but forgotten or only used in ceremonial purposes. And that tells you a lot about 300 years ago or almost 300 years ago, 245 years ago, whatever the case may be, or 240 years ago, that the technology of primitive fire was all but gone at that point. And they didn't use it. They didn't rely on it because other things were much easier. So they had forgotten all about it. So because he couldn't affect fire, one time he had to crawl into a large hollow tree, roll up in his wool blanket, close in the openings in the hollow, and sleep that way for a night. The second time he did a very similar thing. He slept for the night. And because he had slept out two nights, I guess he felt like he had earned back his trust and manhood with the tribe because they then took him to buy another firearm. He makes a very specific notation in his journal that him being able to obtain another gun or another fire lock or flint lock, it would enable him to make fire was he to get lost again and he would spend a comfortable night and travel at sunrise. So there again he makes another reference to I'm going to make fire by flint and steel by using my flint lock mechanism in case I forget my flint and steel, two is one, one is none, but I won't have to resort to a cold winter's night of A, 
curled up inside of a shelter or be on the second night. I believe he could not find shelter, and the only thing he could do was what he described as dance and holler all night long. In other words, exercising to generate metabolic heat. So fire was very important to these people in that it was the first thing that was given to him as a tribe member in the form of flint and steel, and also very important to the frontiersman in that if he had his fire lock, he could not only secure game much easier than with a bow and arrow, but he could also affect fire very easily. And that's what we're going to talk about today is starting a fire with a flint lock. And what I have here is I have a Pennsylvania style what's called a rifle smoothbore, and the reason it's called that is it is a smoothbore 20 gauge musket or smoothbore shotgun, but it has rifle sights on the rear for elevation and windage adjustment, so it's called a rifle smoothbore. And by all accounts, many of the guns described as rifles along the frontier were in fact smoothbore guns. And in the discussion that I posted uh, from yesterday about Daniel Boone, it was said that Daniel Boone favored the smoothbore gun over a rifle during Indian fights and campaigns because it was much easier and faster to load. And number two, you could load whatever shot you decided to load, and he preferred buck and ball loads to get that. I don't have to be perfect. I just got to hit what I'm looking at. So we're going to talk about starting fire with our flintlock device today. And as you know, flintlocks are based on flint and steel technology. You basically have a piece of flint that is put into the cock or the hammer. You have a frizzen that's made of high carbon steel that is pushed down over the top of a powder charge which has a vent hole going to the barrel where your powder charge is stored. When the flint strikes the steel and sparks hit it in the pan, it then throws sparks into the chamber of the gun or into the barrel of the gun igniting the powder which gives you the shot. A lot of people think that these are very slow but they're actually, if you have a well-tuned fire lock or flint lock gun, it's almost instantaneous, which I will show you in this video. So, this gun is not charged. I'll put it on full cock, and I'll show you, and I think you'll be able to see the sparks. And then we'll do what they did to affect fire, and there's a couple ways you could do that. A, you could just put a piece of charred cloth or charred material into this pan and that was one of the things that James Smith described as having in his fire kit that was given to him by the Indians was what he called spunk wood with an S and not just a P it was S-P-U-N-K and I would assume that that means punk wood which was a punky wood that could be charred to affect fire easily because cotton cloth was an expensive commodity back in those days linen and wools were much cheaper and more common than cottons were cotton was for highfalutin people who were not common man as we would say so what we're going to do today is we're going to do what they would normally have done, which was they would put a highly combustible material in their pan with no charge in the gun. And there are accounts in ledger, in diaries and things like that of guns actually being shot off because they walked around with them loaded most of the time. And they would take that small touch hole and plug it with something, and then they would attempt to start the fire. And sometimes that plug would not hold or fall out, and the gun would actually go off when they were attempting to start fire. In this day and age, we don't have to walk around with our guns loaded all the time for fear of being attacked by, you know, anyone. So we can not have a charge in our gun when we do this, and we can effectively start fire safely. So what we're going to do is we're going to put some highly combustible material in here. We're going to pour a few grains of gunpowder on top of that material, which is what they would have done to ignite a flame on that highly combustible material and light our bird nest to flame. Stay with me, guys. Okay, guys, so what we have here is we have a small amount of processed tulip poplar bark here. Tulip poplar bark being one of the best things in the eastern woodlands to affect a small bird nest or fire. And I've processed quite a bit of this up or you know a little bit of it up I should say. And I'm processing it to get the fine hairs exposed. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a small bundle of this of the finest material that I can pull out of here. And I don't want to get any of the big heavy stuff necessarily right now. I just want the thinnest stuff that I can find inside this shredded mess that I've got going on here. And I want to collect up a small amount of that, about a dime size or so. And then I'll put the rest of that just off to the side. And then what I would do with that is I'm going to process that down just a little bit further in my hand to make sure that it's got as much surface area 
as possible. So we'll seat that in off to the side just a little bit and again a few grains of priming powder in here just like this. Close it. Okay, so as I said now, the other method that could be used in the same fashion as this would be to use a piece of charred, pre-charred material. And this is just a piece of charred lamp wick. Again, cotton was an expensive material of the day and probably would not have been wasted for something like this. But we can put this piece of charred cotton material in here exactly the same way. and create an ember in exactly the same fashion that we did before. So having a flintlock firearm along the frontier gave you both the ability to get game but also the ability to start fire. Guys, I'm Dave Canterbury at the Pathfinder School, and I appreciate you joining me out here for another video today. I thank you for everything you do for me, for my school, for my family, for all my affiliates, sponsors, and supporters, and I'll be back in another video as soon as I can. Thanks, guys.